The details of this terrible calamity, the heaviest that had befallen the Romans on foreign soil since the disaster of Crassus in Parthia, I shall endeavour to set forth. Varus Quintilius, descended from a famous rather than high-born family, was a man of mild character and of a quiet disposition, somewhat slow in mind as he was in body, and more accustomed to the leisure of the camp than to actual service in war. That he was no despiser of money is demonstrated by his governorship in Syria. He entered this rich province a poor man, and left this poor province a rich man. When placed in charge of the army in Germania, he entertained the notion that the Germans were a people who were men only in limbs and voice, and that they, who could not be subdued by the sword, could be soothed by the law. With this purpose in mind, he entered the heart of Germania as though he were going among a people enjoying the blessings of peace, and sitting on his tribunal, he wasted the time of a summer campaign in holding court and observing the proper details of legal procedure. But the Germans, who with their great ferocity combine great craft to an extent scarcely credible to one who has had no experience with them and are a race to lying born, by expressing their gratitude that Roman justice was settling these disputes, implied that their own barbarous nature was being softened down by this new and hitherto unknown method, bringing Quintilius to such a complete degree of negligence that he came to look upon himself as city praetor, administering justice in the forum and not a general in command of an army in the heart of Germania. But. Dispatches from Germania brought the baleful news of the death of Varus, and of the slaughter of three legions of as many divisions of cavalry and of six cohorts. An army unexcelled in bravery, the first of Roman armies in discipline, in energy and in experience in the field through the negligence of its general, the craft of its enemy and the unkindness of fortune, was surrounded. Hemmed in by forests and marshes, it was exterminated almost to a man by the very enemy whom it had always slaughtered like cattle, whose life or death had depended solely upon the wrath or the pity of the Romans. The general Varus had more courage to die than to fight, for following the example of his father and grandfather, he ran himself through with his sword. Of the two prefects of the camp, Lucius Aegeus furnished a precedent who, after the greater part of the army had perished, proposed its surrender, preferring to die by torture at the hands of the enemy than in battle. Valla Pneumonius, lieutenant of Varus, who, in the rest of his life, had been an inoffensive and an honourable man, also set a fearful example in that he left the infantry unprotected by the cavalry, and in flight tried to reach the Rhine with his squadrons. But fortune avenged his act, for he did not survive those whom he had abandoned, but died in the act of deserting them. The body of Varus was sent to Caesar, but in spite of the disaster it was honoured by burial in the tomb of his family. From all this, it is evident that Varus, who was, it must be confessed, a man of character and of good intentions, lost his life and his magnificent army more through lack of judgement in the commander than of valour in his soldiers. Paticulus would have written his account of the battle using a stylus on wax or ink on papyrus for more permanent works. Though of course the original is lost, his words have been painstakingly copied and carried down the centuries by medieval monks. This video has been sponsored by Novium, and their hover pens are a fantastic, classy gift idea, and one that reflects the importance of accuracy and precision when recording the past. Crowned one of time's best inventions of 2022, the Novium Hover Pen Interstellar Edition is a stylish and eye-catching refillable ballpoint pen that hovers at a 23.5 degree angle, just like the Earth's axial tilt. Created from aircraft-grade aluminium, it also provides a comfortable and smooth writing experience, certainly preferable to a stylus on wax. The Hover Pen is inspired by the heavens and the premium version even comes with a real shard of meteorite embedded into it, or as the Greeks said, diopetes, things that fall from Zeus. They also have a new future edition, which combines a rollerball and fountain pen into one sleek package. It's a great gift idea, so click on the link in the description and use the code VOTP to get 10% off and free shipping on any hover pen. 
with worldwide shipping. In the year of the Lord's incarnation, 1187, the king of Syria, Saladin, gathered together an army as numerous as the sands of the seashore in order to wage war on the land of Judah. Saladin ordered his forces to push on to Tiberias and besiege it. On Thursday, July the 2nd, the city was surrounded by archers and the battle was joined. The Countess and the Galileans, since the city was not fortified, sent messengers to the Count and King with the news. The Turks have surrounded the city. In the fighting, they have pierced the walls and are just now entering against us. Send help at once or we shall be taken and made captives. And so toward evening on Thursday, July the 2nd, the King of Jerusalem, after he had heard the Galileans' letter, called together all the leaders of the army so that they might give counsel concerning the action to be taken. They all advised that at dawn they should march out, accompanied by the Lord's Cross ready to fight the enemy, with all the men armed and arrayed in battle formation. On Friday, July the 3rd, therefore, they marched out, leaving behind the necessities of life. They came to a hamlet called Mariscalia. At this place they were so constrained by enemy attacks and by thirst that they wished to go no further. They were going to pass through a confined, rocky area in order to reach the Sea of Galilee, which was a mile away. For this reason, the Count sent word to the King. We must hurry and pass through this area so that we and our men may be safe near the water. Otherwise, we will be in danger of making camp at a waterless spot. The king replied, We will pass through at once. The Turks were meanwhile attacking the army's rear, so that the Templars and the others in the rear were barely able to struggle on. But suddenly, the king ordered the tents to be pitched. Thus, we were betrayed to our death. The count, when he looked back and saw the tents pitched, exclaimed, Alas, Lord God, the battle is over. We have been betrayed unto death. The kingdom is finished. And so, in sorrow and anguish, they camped on a dry site, where, during the night, there flowed more blood than water. The sons of Esau surrounded the people of God and set fire to the desert brush round about them. Throughout the night, the hungry and thirsty men were harassed further by arrows and by the fire's heat and flames. At length, after the clouds of death had opened, light dawned on a day of sorrow and tribulation, of grief and destruction. When day had dawned, the king of Syria forsook the city of Tiberias and with his whole army came up to the camping ground to give battle to the Christians. He now prepared to attack our men. Our men formed their battle lines and hurried to pass through this region in the hope that when they had regained a watering place and had refreshed themselves, they could attack and fight the foe more vigorously. But by this time, the Saracens had already arrived. The infantry clambered at full speed to the very summit of a high mountain, leaving the army to its fate. The king, the bishop and the others sent word begging them to return to defend the Lord's cross, the heritage of the crucified. They replied, we are not coming because we are dying of thirst and we will not fight. Again the command was given and again they persisted in their refusal. The Templars and Hospitallers meanwhile were engaged in a fierce rearguard action. They could not win, however, because enemies sprang up on every side shooting arrows and wounding Christians. The units gathered around the Holy Cross where they were confused and intermixed here and there. The men who were with the Count of Tripoli in the first group saw that the King, the Hospitallers, the Templars and everyone were all jumbled together and mingled with the Turks. They cried out, those who can get through may go, since the battle is not going in our favour. We've now lost even the chance to flee. Meanwhile, thousands and thousands of Syrians were charging at the Christians, shooting arrows and killing them. A large group of pagans charged on the infantry and pitched them from the top of the steep mountain to whose summit they had previously fled. They destroyed the rest, taking some captive and killing others. Upon seeing this, 
the Count and his men, who had been riding onward together with Balian of Naples and Reginald of Sidon, turned back. The speed of their horses in this confined space trampled down the Christians and made a kind of bridge, giving the riders a level path. In this manner, they got out of that narrow place by fleeing over their own men, over the Turks, and over the cross. The Saracens gathered around the Lord's wooden cross, the king, and the rest, and destroyed the church. What more can be said? The Saracens triumphed over the Christians and did with them as they pleased. What can I say? It would be more fitting to weep and wail than to say anything. Alas, should I describe with impure lips how the precious wood of the Lord, our Redeemer, was seized by the damnable hands of the damned? Woe to me that in the days of my miserable life I should be forced to see such things. I believe you will be astonished at seeing this letter on account of the slight certainty that could have existed as to my being alive. I've not had an opportunity to write to you for more than a year. I've not done so until now that God has brought me to these states of Flanders, where I arrived 12 days ago with the Spaniards who escaped from the ships that were lost in Ireland, Scotland and Shetland, which were more than 20 of the largest in the Armada. The galleon San Pedro in which I sailed received much injury from many heavy cannonballs, and although they were repaired as well as was possible at the time, there were still some hidden shot holes through which much water entered. After the fierce engagement we had off Calais on the 8th of August, continuing from the morning till 7 o'clock in the evening, our armada being in the act of retiring, the fleet of the enemy followed behind to drive us from their country but seeing that the enemy had stopped, some of the ships in our armada trimmed up and repaired their damages. I remained in the ship, in which we were in imminent danger of death, because she opened so much with a storm that sprang up that she continuously filled with water, and we could not dry her out with the pumps. All the armada proceeded, scattered in such manner by the storm that some ships went to Germany, others drove on the islands of Holland and Zealand into the enemy's hands, Others went to Shetland, others to Scotland where they were lost and burned. More than 20 were lost in the Kingdom of Ireland. As I said, the ship I sailed in was attached to two others, very large, to afford us aid if they could. Not being able to weather round Cape Clear in Ireland on account of the severe storm which arose upon the bow, we were forced to make for the land with these three ships, which, as I say, were of the largest size, and to anchor more than half a league from the shore where we remained for four days without being able to make any provision, nor could it even be made. On the fifth day, there sprang up so great a storm on our beam with a sea up to the heavens, so that the cables could not hold nor the sails serve us, and we were driven ashore with all three ships upon a beach covered with very fine sand, shut in on one side and the other by great rocks. Such a thing was never seen, for within the space of an hour all three ships were broken in pieces, so that there did not escape three hundred men, and more than one thousand were drowned, among them many persons of importance, captains, gentlemen, and other officials. Don Diego Enriquez died there one of the saddest deaths that has ever been seen in the world. In consequence of fearing the very heavy sea that was washing over the highest part of the wrecks, he took his ship's boat that was decked, and he and the son of the Count of Villafranca and two other Portuguese gentlemen, with more than 16,000 ducats in jewels and crown pieces, placed themselves under the deck of the said boat and gave the order to close and cork the hatchway by which they had entered. But thereupon, more than seventy men, who had remained alive, jumped from the ship to the boat, and while she was making for the land, so great a wave washed over her that she sank, and all on deck were swept away. Then she drifted along, rolling over in different directions with the waves, until she went ashore, where she settled, wrong side up and by these mischances the gentlemen who had placed themselves under the deck died within.
More than a day and a half after she had grounded, some savages arrived, who turned her up for the purpose of extracting nails or pieces of iron, and breaking through the deck, they drew out the dead men. Don Diego Enriquez expired in their hands, and they stripped him and took away the jewels and money which he had. And as it would not be right to admit my own good fortune and how I got onto land, I say that I placed myself on the top of the poop of my ship, and having commended myself to God and to Our Lady, and from thence I gazed at the terrible spectacle. Many were drowning within the ships. Others, casting themselves into the water, sank to the bottom without returning to the surface. Others on rafts and barrels, and gentlemen on pieces of timber. Others cried aloud in the ships, calling upon God. Captains threw their chains and crown pieces into the sea. The waves swept others away, washing them out of the ships. Most of her complement of men and all the captains and officers were already drowned and dead when I determined to seek means of safety for my life, and placed myself upon a piece of the ship that had been broken off, and the judge advocate followed me, loaded with crown pieces, which he carried stitched up in his waistcoat and trousers. I managed to find another resource, which was to take the cover of a hatchway, but when I tried to place myself upon it, it sank with me to a depth six times my height below the surface, and I swallowed so much water that I was nearly drowned. When I came up again, I called to the judge advocate and managed to get him upon the hatchway cover with myself. But in the act of casting off from the ship, there came a huge wave, breaking over us in such a manner that the judge advocate was unable to resist it. And the wave bore him away and drowned him, crying out and calling upon God while drowning. Eventually, there came four waves, one after the other, and without knowing how or knowing how to swim, they cast me upon the shore. Managing to rest a little, I began to doze, and when fast asleep at about one o'clock in the night, I was disturbed by a great noise of men on horseback. There were more than two hundred of them, who were going to plunder and destroy the ships. I turned to call my companion to see if he slept, and found he was dead, which occasioned me great affliction and grief. There he lay on the ground, with more than six hundred others, without there being anyone to bury them. Not even poor Don Diego Enriquez. After we'd been citizens of Moscow for four weeks, Napoleon refused the peace treaty proposed to him, and the army, which had advanced some 30 hours further on, had to retreat, because the Russian army stationed in Moldavia was approaching. Now it was October the 17th, and Napoleon held an army review, and announced the departure of October 18th, early in the morning at 3 o'clock, with the warning that whoever should delay one hour would fall into the hands of the enemies. All beer, brandy, etc. was abandoned, and whatever was still intact was ordered to be burned. Napoleon himself had the Kremlin undermined and blown up. All had an odd experience as they set out, for they filled, as far as was possible, everything with sugar and so-called Moscow tea, in order to withstand the future misery. Then everyone packed up, and the enemy attacked us. All ran in a crowded retreat, the army moving toward Kaluga, with the Cossacks in front of us and beside us. Those who were too weak to carry their weapons or knapsacks threw them away, and all looked like a crowd of gypsies. Then we came to a second city, Borovsk. Here the city was immediately ablaze, and in order for us to get through, soldiers had to be used to quench the flames. Camp was pitched by this city, and it became dark. One no sooner thought of resting than the Russians fell upon our army and cut off many as captives. Everything was in confusion, and during almost the whole night the throng had to retreat to Moshaisk, everyone running so as not to fall into the hands of the enemy. Because of these considerable losses, cannon, munition wagons, coaches and baggage wagons by the hundreds had to be thrown into the water, and where that was not impossible, all wagons were burned, not one wheel being permitted to remain whole. The fighting, the shrieking, the firing of large and small guns, hunger and thirst and all conceivable torments increased the never-ending confusion. Indeed, even the lice seemed to seek supremacy, 
for their number on both officers and privates was in the thousands. In these days, it snowed for the first time, and the snow remained. The cold arrived at the same time too, and the freezing of the people multiplied the number of the dead. No one could walk fifty paces without seeing men stretched out half, or completely dead. We arrived at Smolensk on November the 12th, having made from Moscow to that city 26 days and nights of travel without pausing a day. If we travelled only 12 hours daily, then we had retreated 312 hours up to Smolensk. Here we settled down and had to camp for two days. As had been reported to us beforehand, we were to engage in battle with the enemy here and also get bread and flour from the warehouses. Neither of the two reports, however, proved to be true. The distress mounted higher and higher, and horses were shot and eaten. While we tarried two days at Smolensk, the Russians advanced and awaited us at Minsk. Everyone hastily fled. Cannon were thrown into the water, the hospitals were nearly all left to the enemy, and, as were commonly rumoured, the hospitals were set afire and burned with their inmates. Now, as the march went on, I had to leave my sled behind and lay my baggage on the horse, upon which I also mounted often during the day. The cold increased again that same day and the road became as smooth as a mirror from the rain, so that the horses fell down in great number and could not get up again. However, since my horse was a native of the country, it had no horseshoes and could always help itself up again when it had fallen. It had even the good custom, wherever we went downhill, of sitting down on its rump, bracing its front feet forward and sliding into the valley in this fashion without my dismounting. At night in Dubrovna, when the enemy had given up their manoeuvres, everyone settled down in and around the place. Every night the fires for warming could be seen over a region four hours long and wide, reddening the sky like red cloth. Again and again people died, and sometimes froze to death. These were people who pressed towards the fire but were seldom permitted to get there, so they died away from the fire. Every soldier was like an officer now, since none of the uniforms showed any distinction in rank and no superior could command a private. Officers were beaten away from the fire, just as privates were, whenever they tried to press forward without merited claim. Only mutual support still procured true friendship. I thought of my friends at home and compared my misery and approaching end with my former life of plenty. I remembered a common saying at home, a campaign is always made out to be worse than it was. With this common notion I consoled myself, thinking, it's well that you, my beloved kindreds and friends, know nothing of my condition, for it would only cause you pain and it would be of no use to me. When we came near the Beresina River, there was a place where Napoleon ordered his pack horses to be unharnessed and where he ate. He watched his army pass by in the most wretched condition. What he may have felt in his heart is impossible to surmise. His outward appearance seemed indifferent and unconcerned over the wretchedness of his soldiers. Only ambition and lost honour may have made themselves felt in his heart. And, although the French and allies shouted into his ears many oaths and curses about his own guilty person, he was still able to listen to them, unmoved. After his guard had already disbanded and he was almost abandoned, he collected a voluntary corps at Dubrovna, which was enrolled with many promises and received the name of Holy Squadron. After a short time, however, this existed in name only, for the enemy reduced even them to nothing. Finally, we came to Ortelsburg and for the first time were given regular quarters. From this city I went on to Malava, and at that place received quarters again. It was just Christmas Eve, a date I would not have known had I not learnt it from the landlord. Here, I also washed myself for the first time. The washing of my hands and face proceeded very slowly because the crusts on my hands, ears and nose had grown like fur lark, with cracks and coal-black scales. 
My face resembled that of a heavily bearded Russian peasant, and when I looked in the mirror, I was astonished myself at the strange appearance. I washed, then, for an hour, with hot water and soap. However, I felt I had only become somewhat smoother and lighter, but I could not notice any removal of the blackness and the scales. The General said he wanted some Marines to man the first troop ship that lands. Isn't it splendid? We've got the job. Wedgwood, Illingworth, Parker and myself. Also, we shall see the whole thing. I believe we start the landing this week. I think it will be short but sharp to take Gallipoli. About midnight the anchor was weighed and we stood out to sea. Sleep was impossible, such was the crowded state of the ship, not to mention the intense excitement of our mission. It was a glorious night. Now we were fairly embarked on our perilous enterprise, and one thought with a thrill that the dawn would bring our baptism of fire. One felt somehow as if one were grasping hands across the centuries with the great adventurers of ancient times. Was it on such a night as this that the Roman fleet put out from the Gallic shores towards the unknown cliffs of Britain? Did Norman William gaze out at that same silvery moon when his flotilla sat out on their great enterprise? And the old crusaders, were their warlike spirits watching eagerly the start of this new crusade against the ancient foe? We felt, that night, on the old River Clyde, that we were living history over again as we forged ahead towards the Turkish coast. About two o'clock we slowed down to a mere crawl, and we know we were near our goal. Clearly now we could hear the guns, although as yet we could see nothing of the ships. The dull thudding drew nearer and nearer and the more distinct as we slid slowly ahead, until, all on a sudden, away to starboard we saw a red flash through the murk, and the rolling boom that followed told us we were nearing the fleet and that the great bombardment had begun. Almost at once the Clyde began to speed up, and soon we were forging ahead towards the booming guns. It was now light enough to discern the black shapes of warships lying on both sides of us and ahead, and soon we could only dimly make out a darker grey line along the horizon that showed the land. Nearer and nearer we grew, passing between lines of great ships that flashed and smoked and thundered and all of a sudden the dawn rang along the eastern horizon in streaks of scarlet and gold, and we saw that we were almost in the midst of the fleet. And there, away to port, was a line of shore, undulating in rows of round-topped hills that were spangled with sudden flashes of scarlet flame. It was the Turkish coast, and the guns of the fleet were preparing our way. Now we were right in the midst of the battleships and the thunder of their guns seemed to rend the firmament. All of a sudden, there were two plops in the water a few yards short of the ship and we were now fully conscious that shells were being fired at the Clyde from somewhere or other and falling uncomfortably close too. There was a soft jar that quivered from end to end of the ship and she was aground. All was now excitement on board, up till now not a shot had been fired from the shore, and indeed we had begun to wonder whether the landing was to be unopposed, but hardly had the hopper's bow appeared beyond her huge consort when the whole slope leapt into a roar of firing, and a tempest of lead poured down upon the devoted craft and her gallant crew. Disaster overwhelmed her in an instant. Nothing could live in such a torrent of lead, and in a moment the middy at the wheel and every soldier on the deck of the little ship was shot down. Devoid of guidance, the hopper went astray and beached side on, while the barges all went out of line. The connecting ropes broke under the strain, and they came to rest in a hopeless muddle with the farthest barge lying helplessly in deep water about twenty yards from the shore. The bridge of boats had failed and the officers hastily met to construct a new plan. Out of the six boats that formed one tow, only one reached the shore and beached side on, and out from among the crowded benches only about a dozen men leapt into the water and rushed for the sand. Their comrades still crouched upright in the boats, 
but they were strangely still, shot dead where they sat. The other four boats never reached the shore. As we watched in wordless horror, one of the boats floated slowly past us, bumping along our side, and we could look straight down into her motionless cargo. It was a floating shambles. Slowly, the ghastly boat scraped along our sides and drifted out to sea, leaving us frozen with a nameless horror and an overpowering dread. Such was our introduction to the glories of war, and when one big fellow turned his drawn white face to us with a slow, good God, as we stared at the vanishing boat, we could only look at him in a tight-throated silence and wonder what in heaven's name it all meant. Then the order was given, and up they all leaped and rushed for the rocks while a hail of rifle and machine gun fire beat upon them. Wildly they leaped from boat to boat in that gallant rush, while we on the ship cheered wildly at the sight, until they reached the last boat, when they leaped down into the water and started wading towards the rocks that were their goal, holding up their rifles high above their heads. But to our horror, we saw them suddenly begin to flounder and fall in the water, disappearing from view and then struggling to the surface again with uniform and pack streaming, only to go down again, never to reappear as the hailing bullets flicked the life out of the struggling men. The price to be paid was too awful, and at slightly less than two hours after the Clyde had run ashore, operations were suspended and it was decided to wait till nightfall before a further attempt at landing should be made. The beach now presented a terrible spectacle. Such of us that were not engaged working the guns would crouch with ready rifle waiting to catch a snapshot from behind the bulwarks at the dim figures that flitted from house to house as the shells smashed and wrecked the buildings. And that was all we saw of the enemy. Thanks for watching, and thanks to the Novium Hoverpen for supporting history content on YouTube.